All right. Ready to rock? We are live. Hey, feasters. We're talking knife sharpening. Give me just a second. Hey, David, are you there? Yeah. Uh, does, I don't think we posted a link in the group. Um, okay, I'll add it. I mean, it's going to be, it's working in the office as well, so. Oh, okay. All right. Some days I'm just really technologically challenged. Sorry, Feasters. So, we're here today, we're going to talk about knife sharpening. Uh, knife sharpening is definitely something that you develop skill with over time. Uh, the more you do it, the better you get at it. And with some knives, it can be more challenging. Other knives, it can be very, very simple. Um, before we get into the annals of knife sharpening, though, I just I have a whole bunch of knives laid out here. You can see them all. And I just wanted to talk about some of these different knives in case some of you have them and you're like, oh, I have this knife. It came in a set. What the hell do I do with it? So let's start. This is a standard pairing knife. Sorry about the glare. Uh, this one happens to be made out of carbon steel and it's been hammered. This is a Japanese style pairing knife. So typically, a paring knife is used for small cut jobs, uh, things like mincing garlic, mincing shallots. A lot of people find it uh, much easier to do those small things with a paring knife, with a smaller knife, than with a regular chef's knife. Its smaller side leads to greater dexterity, essentially, uh, more maneuverability. It's swifter. Uh, and just like when you hold your chef knife, you hold it the same way. So a finger or two on the blade, a couple fingers on the handle, see that side? And on the reverse side, I'm going to flip it up. I'm pinching with my thumb on the other side. So come in, index finger, thumb touching on the back so they're pinching. can hold another finger on the blade and the rest gripping the handle. This is going to give you a lot greater control when you hold a knife. So once again, this is a pairing knife. This is what it's for. And there are different shaped ones. Um, different cuisines evolved different types of knives independently of each other. Um, they all do fall into broad families of knives, like a pairing knife. But this pairing knife is a Japanese style, like I said. Uh, there's a couple different styles of French pairing knives, there's Chinese styles, um, any of them, they all do the same thing, they're just designed a little differently. It's up to you to find out which one you like. This is a chef's knife. Look at that glare. Uh, so this is a all-purpose Japanese chef knife. Uh, you'll notice you can see these dimples running on the edge, on the blade, I should say, and they run on both sides. Essentially, these are there to prevent food from sticking to the knife. Um, when the knife cuts into something, there's a lot of pressure put on the cut surface, and it can stick to the blade of the knife. I'm sure that happens to many of us all the time. These dimples here help air get in between what you're cutting and the knife blade and prevent things from sticking. So uh, this, I like Mac Knives, M-A-C. Uh, they are a Japanese company. They make really good knives. Uh, they do do carbonized steel. And one thing to keep in mind, there's stainless steel knives and there's carbon steel knives. 
those are two big families of knives. There are knives made out of other, allo other alloys. Uh, carbon steel is softer. It holds a sharper edge, but not for as long as stainless steel will. Uh, stainless steel is harder. It won't hold as sharp as an edge, but it'll hold an edge for longer. We're going to get into that in just a minute. So here's a chef's knife. I use my chef knife for everything. I use it as a paring knife, as a fillet knife, um, as a boning knife, you name it. Speaking of boning knives, this is a boning knife. Uh, boning knives are thin, very thin, and they're long and tapered, usually with a pronounced tip. And they also have this bit of a guard here. So this knife, because it's so thin and you can see, this is very flexible. So this knife is meant to be dragged along the side of bones, and kind of hook under them and curve around them uh, to cut the meat away from them. This is a type of knife that a butcher will use. Um, it's good to have one around. It's not an everyday use. I don't use it that often, only when I buy whole cuts of meat that have bones in them that I am going to be boning out. But it's good to have. Uh, this flare down here at the end kind of acts as a bit of a guard as you're working. And it's also a good place to rest your thumb and your finger, that pinch hold I showed you before. Um, it disperses the pressure put on by your hand so that you don't have to put it on this thin part where there isn't much to grab and you can cut yourself. So uh, do be careful with your boning knives if you have one and you decide to use it. Like I said, they are flexible, but I have seen them being bent when they're being used and the middle right here like snapping out of them and flying off and hitting people. So be careful with your boning knife. Next, I have a fillet knife. Uh, once again, a uh, fillet knife, um, similar construct to a boning knife. Uh, except it isn't as narrow, it's wider, uh, it is very, very thin, and it is very flexible. So this knife is used to butcher fish. Um, this wider flat blade is really good for running alongside fish bones as you're cutting into a whole fish. Uh, it's, it's flexible so it can curve over a fish's spine onto the other side of the meat as you're boning out. I'll show you how to bone out a fish one day, but it does. The knife does need a curve. Um, you know, if you have a fillet knife, it's good. It's good to have on hand. Um, like I said, I use my chef's knife for virtually everything, but I do have these knives because I like to use them from time to time, and it's fun to have big, sharp things around your house. This is a bread knife. Uh, it's a serrated blade. You can see the waviness here. Uh, serrated blades, one thing to keep in mind, you can't sharpen this bad boy at home. Uh, there are some gimmicky sharpeners out there that will sharpen a serrated blade, but they don't do a very good job. Um, this has a very interesting edge on it, aside from the fact that it's wavy. And it's wavy because it gives it more surface area and greater cutting force. When you... Sphere, can you hold on that? Sorry. Uh, when you cut with this, you let the knife do the cutting. You don't put pressure down like you do with other knives. You drag along. And this works like the teeth of a saw. Um, that greater surface area, more contact with the food that you're cutting, and it'll slice through really easily. This is also, aside from being um, great for bread, being a bread knife, Serrated knives like this are also great for vegetables that have tougher skins. Um, things like eggplant and tomatoes cut beautifully using a serrated blade. So I do use this um, from time to time, especially with a lot of heirloom varieties of tomatoes who have tough skin but soft flesh. This is beautiful because, like I said, you're gently dragging it across the food and the teeth are doing the cutting as opposed to the blade and the hand doing your cutting with a normal knife. So you don't put pressure down on a food. It's great for delicate food. This is a slicing knife. Um, it's long and thin. 
similar to the fillet knife and boning knife, but the sole purpose of this knife, and it is not flexible, at least not very much, um, the purpose of this knife is to um, carve things like a roast or a turkey, bigger pieces of meat that need a long bit of draw and a lot of slicing motion on them. This is the knife you use for that. Uh, this is really kind of just a few time of year knife, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, Passover, whatever. Um, great for slicing br brisket, like I said, turkey, excellent. Um, any type of roulade or rolled up food, a knife like this would have been great to slice up uh, your roasted pork loin with. This bad boy at 13 and 7 eighths inches long uh, is an old school French chef knife. And you can see the difference between a Japanese chef knife and this old school French chef knife. This thing is super heavy. Um, this will hack anything from blocks of uh, Parmesan cheese, or I should say huge wheels of Parmesan cheese, to rabbits, to chickens, to you name it. Um, it's big, it's unwieldy, it's hard to control. Uh, if you're someone who's serious about really working on your knife skills, start with smaller knives and work up to bigger knives. If you can use a big knife, you could use any small knife. I love this thing. This is a rare heirloom, just so you know. This is made by Jay Sabatier. It's priceless. This is a cleaver. Uh, this one is a Chinese-style vegetable cleaver. And all cleavers are relatively designed the same way, but a vegetable cleaver will typically have a handle that's molded into the blade, so it's the same material, and it's hollow. Um, a meat cleaver will typically have a tang in it, which is just a strip of metal with uh, just the regular clams, like these wooden parts, or plastic parts, or whatever you have on your knife. Um, the vegetable cleaver, this is specifically designed for slicing and cutting vegetables. And also, you use this as like a scoop to pick things up off your board. Uh, Chinese chefs love these. Um, they're used really heavily in Asia. Outside of Asia, cleavers are really only used to butcher meat and to really cut through heavier parts of bone. So, like I said, this is a vegetable cleaver. I wouldn't use this to cut through um, heavy pieces of bone. Because like I said, this handle is joined here. It's a hollow handle. If I whack through a bone, it would vibrate a lot, cause some hand pain, and could potentially break at this point. So those are a bunch of different knives. Uh, let's get into some things about knife sharpening um, before I actually show you how to sharpen your knives. And give me a second here. I just want to check to see if anybody has posted any questions. Sorry about the downtime. Um, Nadia, I will post a mushroom barley recipe for you. 
but I think that's from last week or the week before. All right, back with you. So um, I drew up some diagrams here for you. This is, you can see that? It says Japanese edge. So I'll be able to make a better display with it with my hands. So a Japanese edge on the blade, the edge has one straight side and the other side's at an angle. Um, this is really, really good for cutting fish and softer things uh, as opposed to harder meats or harder things, um, cheeses, uh, different types of meat, and it's referred to as a Japanese edge. Most knives don't have a Japanese edge, and it is something you would have to customly, uh, you'd have to do custom like on your knife. This is. That's right, a European edge. And this is what most of us keep on our knives. Um, a European edge, your knife comes to a typical you know, point, the edge, or like this, if we're looking at the other way. Um, it means the blade's been sharpened on both sides as opposed to the uh, uh, Japanese uh, style where it's just been sharpened on one side and it's straight on the other. Um, both both styles have pros and cons. Uh, European edge is the most. It's. I don't want to necessarily say it's easier to maintain, but it's more common to maintain. Uh, so more pe more people, when you sharpen the techniques you use to sharpen, are geared towards that. So, let's get into really quick why we sharpen our blades and then why we hone our blades. So this is a diagram of a blade I drew. Okay, so running along the bottom here is the edge itself and then this area here is the blade and you can see on the edge I drew these little pock marks. That's referred to as a pitted edge and these are little microscopic um, pits that can occur on the bottom of the blade, you really can't even see them with your naked eye, but they're there. Um, and they lead to the knife being dull. If you can see them, then you need to do some major work on your knife. Um, not major, it's not destroyed, but you really got to get, get some good sharpening done. Uh, like I said, these can lead to ineffective cutting. They can lead to the knife, like if you're cutting down on the board, like wobbling back and forth. Um, and uh, on a more serious note, they can actually lead to stress fractures in the metal. Um, metal is uh, crystalline in structure, and uh, between those crystals, you can cause fractures. And uh, if those pits aren't sharpened out of the blade, uh, they can get bigger and actually cause things to crack. So it is a safety issue. I've seen very few knives crack because of pitting. But uh, it's not unheard of. And it's just something you want to be able to avoid. This, if you can see, is a rolled edge. See there? A bit of the edge rolled over. So when you sharpen a knife or when you use a knife, you literally have to think that the edge, the very part of the knife that you're cutting with, it is microscopically thin. In fact, um, most knives have an edge, if they're sharpened properly, that is thinner than the width of a human hair. So that's very thin, and that very easily bends, can bend in other directions, and it can cause that rolled edge. So, um, when you sharpen your knives, you realign. You go from the rolled edge, which happens just with normal use to everybody's knives, and you realign it to being straight. So it could be rolled a little bit, and then it goes straight. So talking about the rolled edge, that's where these babies come into play. These are sharpening steels. And they're kind of incorrectly named sharpening steels. Uh, uh, more often, chefs will refer to them as honing steels. 
because they hone the blade. Um, running this way are microscopic grooves. Uh, this is essentially like a glorified file, like a nail file, but the grooves run this way. This one is made out of metal, and this one I have here I use for my carbon steel knives because they're softer. This is made out of ceramic, and it also has the grooves. This one is round. My metal one, you can see, is oval-shaped. So I'd only, you only use um, the sides here, not this edge, uh, to hone it. And when you hone a knife, you take it up against the steel. You hold the knife at about a 20-degree angle. You can see that. And you bring the knife down on both sides. And what this does is it acts like a buffer. So you have that rolled edge from normal use. It shaves off this bit of the roll and realigns the knife. So it doesn't really resharpen your knife. It just realigns the edge slightly. Um, and it only works up into a certain point. After a while, you do have to resharpen the knife. Same with the ceramic steel. You rub the knife up and down. And what you want when you're rubbing up and down, you want to start here at this area of, of uh, the wide end of the blade down by the hilt of the knife. The hilt is where the blade joins the handle. Go to the wide and drag your knife to the tip. And you do that on both sides, wide and to the tip. And like I said, you want to leave your knife, if this is the sharpening steel, leave your knife at about an angle like this to the steel uh, to line up with the blade. And that's about 20% give or take. All right. So there's several different types of stones and sharpeners out there. Uh, give me one second. Let me show you a sharpener. Okay, so this, I'm sure some of you have something like this. This is uh, a titanium V sharpener. This I would not use on any knife knife, nice knife. If you have something, especially I would not use this on a carbon steel knife. Inside this part right here, you can kind of see there's a V in there. There's two titanium blades in there that hit each other like this, and you drag your knife through this part, and it hopefully realigns the edge and sharpens it. Um, but for artisan knives or craft knives, I wouldn't use this thing. I do have a bunch of like $10 and $15 throwaway knives that you know, I've used in various kitchens, that knives that just... They're there in case someone decides to steal your knives. You know, it's no big deal if you lose it. I'll use this bad boy for those. Um, but that's really about it. So stones you have. And unfortunately, I don't have um, a rough and medium grit stone. I uh, just can't find mine for some reason. But I'm sure you've seen them. Um, they're sandwiched. One side is like a light gray, and the other side is like a charcoal gray. Uh, the charcoal gray side will be heavy grit, so the grit on there is very large, and those are really good for grinding and getting the pits out of your blade and doing the initial stage of sharpening. You want to go from a heavier grit, a larger grit stone, to finer grit stones as you're working. Larger grit, like I said, that'll get rid of the big bumps and nicks and overhangs that develop on the blade. And then the finer stones, as you move down, they hone the blade, they sharpen it even more. And some of them are so fine that their sole purpose is just to put a mirrored, shiny finish on the blade. It's just an aesthetic thing. So I have here, um, this is a Japanese-style ceramic whetstone. And that's W-H-E-T-S-T-O-N-E. -E. Uh, this uh, is virtually non-porous. This is designed to be used with water. Water is put onto its surface, and the knife is sharpened on here. And these come in di different grits. Um, they're relatively inexpensive, and 50 to $70, depending on the stone. But 
you're going to get 20, 30, 40 years of use out of it. So it's a very, very worthwhile investment. I also have here, this is a modern sharpening stone. This is a diamond plate. So um, this metal on the top here has been embedded with millions or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands bits of industrial grade diamonds and those do the same thing as a traditional grit was. Some people argue that these work a little better um, and this is also designed to be used with water. Now the other stone I was referring to too uh, before the one that's double layered um, those dark gray charcoal ones or the light gray charcoal ones those can either be an oil stone or a wet stone meaning water uh, they can't be both. And if it's a wet stone, you simply sprinkle water on it when you're sharpening. If it's an oil stone, then you sprinkle oil on it on the face of it when you're sharpening. Uh, in terms of what's easier, better, there's a lot of debate. Some people prefer oil. Some people prefer water. Uh, me, just for ease and cleanliness, I like water. Um, this way I can just put my stones back in the cabinet and I don't have to worry about them leaving oily gunk and residue all over things or uh, when I'm sharpening on a surface I don't have to worry about oil getting all over the place. It's really a personal preference, oil versus water. Um, so let's get to sharpening. I think you can see this. Yeah. <clears throat> so I have my stone here and I've set it down on a towel. One thing that I like to do is get a little bit of water down on the towel, and you can use paper towels or whatever towel. The water is going to help your towel stick to the surface that you're sharpening on, and keep things from sliding around. Uh, it also keep keep your stone from sliding around. So that's definitely one thing that's a good thing to do. Sorry, I'm still with you. I'm just uh, checking some question posts. Okay. I hope this has been informative to everybody so far. So like I said, put a little bit of water down <clears throat> on the towel on the surface here. Uh, allows it to, to not stick or, or to actually stick and not move around on you. Uh, if you are using oil, this is when you would squirt oil on here. I'm using water. So I'm putting just a little bit of water on here and kind of pushing it around. It doesn't have to be evenly spread over the stone or anything, uh, but it just has to be there. So what's important is the angle you keep your knife at. And this is really, really important. So typically the angle uh, most guidebooks and whatnot or books on the subject will tell you relatively about 20%. So that means that it's about right there, if you can see that. 20% or 15 to 20% actually equates to about the thickness of two pennies. So lay your blade, your knife on the stone and lift up the back end of it, uh, keeping the edge on the stone and kind of measure out or actually put two pennies on there. Uh, if, this, if the blade is about two pennies width above the stone, then it's at the correct angle to sharpen it. Now there's a few techniques for sharpening. Uh, a traditional European uh, sharpen is long and drawn out. So you start, uh, make sure your knife's at the correct angle, 
have one hand holding the handle. I also like to keep some fingers on the blade. And then your other hand, I keep actually close to or on the edge. You can see that close to or on the edge. And as long as you keep this edge touching your stone, you won't worry about cutting your fingers. But you have to make sure that you don't all of a sudden like lift up this edge while your fingers are there. Over time, it becomes very easy. At first, maybe you want to keep your fingers back a little bit, more on the blade as opposed to closer to the edge. So, uh, a European technique, and you always start at the, the back edge of the blade here, and you come, and you draw the whole knife up in a swooping motion. Use the whole length of the stone, draw it up, and then hook over so you get the tip of the knife. I'm sorry, I'm doing this at a weird angle so you guys can see, so... So that's it. And then when you flip over and do the other side, once again, same thing. Use the whole length of the stone, start at the back of the blade here, and draw it in a hooking motion. Uh, other styles, which are mainly Asian styles, one is a back and forth grind. So you hold your blade at the right angle, you hold your fingers down on the blade at the edge or close to it, your other hand on the knife, and you literally go straight back and forth up and down the stone. This is a really, really great technique for someone who's just first starting to sharpen their knives. Uh, and I recommend doing it this way. Uh, you'll have the greatest amount of control. You'll be able to sharpen your knife in these little sections. All right? So you'll be able to play, pay closer attention to them. And you literally, you just go up and, up and down. Up and down the stone. Back and forth. Now, on the back here, I have my thumb and it's pressed up against the back of the knife and then you can see a little bit of my thumb there down touching the stone. I'm using my thumb in the back here to maintain this angle and kind of use it as use my thumb as a guide for where the blade should be angled at that around 20 percent give or take. And go back and forth. Back and forth. Nice and simple. And then as you're ready to move to the next section of the blade, same thing. Back and forth. Back and forth. And if your fingers are back off the edge a little bit, back and forth. And you will hear a little bit of grinding and grating, like you're essentially shaving off bits of metal of the knife to hone the blade back in and resharpen it. So don't be afraid if it sounds like it is grinding. It's supposed to. You know, and then up at the tip, too. Back and forth, back and forth. And you'll flip the knife over and do it back around for the other side of the blade. And you can see when I flip the knife over, just like I was using my thumb previously to help me guide where the angle should be, I'm using my index finger this time. I'm keeping my index finger on the knife itself, going back and forth. And I have the blade about middle way up on my index finger. You know, about yay big, about two pennies thickness. And it works as a good guide. And I just keep going back and forth. And depending on how, no, how dull your knives are, I mean, this could be a long process for you if you're someone who's never sharpening your knives and they're really dull. Um, professional chefs are always in the habit of sharpening their knives every day. And whenever I'm at work, my other work besides feast, uh, I do sharpen my knives every day, sometimes twice in a, a day because they get a lot, a lot of work uh, done. And the blade can go really quickly, especially with cheap knives. So, um, you know, I recommend practicing. Do this every day. And this is a good thing to do, like, set up on your table and have Netflix streaming on your laptop and watch a movie and sharpen some knives, you know? All right, so the last technique is a circular grind. I have a friend that calls it the swirly. 
So you hold your knife just like you had been for the other techniques, and instead of going in this sweeping hook motion like a lot of Europeans do, or this back and forth like a lot of Asians do, uh, you do this circular. And I'm literally going, you know, in a circular fashion. I'm holding the angle of the knife, and I'm moving it in a circular, circular fashion all over the stone. And then I'll move to the next section of the knife, and go in a circular fashion. So, you know, the reason I've showed you these three different techniques is I use all three of these every time I sharpen a knife. Um, in no particular order either. Sometimes I feel like doing a long drawn out swipe. Sometimes I just feel like going back and forth. Like I said, this is really good for beginners. And this is also really good if you really, really do need to rework your knife. It really, really allows you to put a lot of energy into pushing down and grinding uh, away a bad edge. And then a lot of times I use the circular. So it's really up to you. Like whatever you want to do is totally cool. Uh, there's really um, no right or wrong way in terms of the technique you use for sharpening your knife. Like I said, Angle is one of the is probably the most important thing. If the angle's too high, first off, your knife is barely gonna slide across, uh, and you're gonna create a really weird edge on your knife, and you don't want that. It's just pointless. So you know, keep the knife at that about 20 degree angle, 15 to 20 degree angle, and go ahead and sharpen. So um, sharper knife. A sharper knife is a safer knife. Doll knives are very, very, very unsafe. So don't mess around with doll knives. Those are when accidents happen. A doll knife, instead of cutting food, is actually going to bounce off the surface of it. And that bounce is going to cause the knife to slip. Um, it could slip into your hand and cut your fingers. It could slip and slide off the cutting board. There's a lot of things that could happen. So dull knives are very, very hazardous. I know it sounds a little backwards. You think, oh, a sharp knife, it's wicked sharp, and it's going to cut me, yada, yada. But no, a sharp knife, a very sharp knife, will really only cut what you're trying to cut. Um, and it won't move around. It shouldn't slip and slide on you or bounce off of food. So um, keep those knives sharp. So I do want to show you the other stone. Um, but it's the same thing that I was just showing you for this other technique, or for these, for this stone. And you will notice, I don't know if you can see on my fingertips really, they're looking kind of gray. That's literally bits of metal that were shaved off the knife that have gotten onto your hands. This cleans off really easily with like a green scrubby and some soap and water. So uh, just so you know, so this stone is uh, like a technically a medium grit wet stone. It's about 2,000. Um, a heavier grit stone is going to be the essentially the lower the number, the heavier the grit, or the larger the grit. Uh, so a heavy grit stone really used for like really working the knife really good, the, the, the type of stone I like to start with. I usually start with anywhere like, uh, 800 grit to 1,000 grit. Then I'll move to this stone and then even to a finer stone like a 3,000 to 5,000 to polish them up really nice. So here's the wet stone. Once again, just getting a little water on the surface and it doesn't have to be a lot. Just push it around a little. doesn't have to completely cover. And we sharpen. Remember to keep the knife at that angle and I'm using the back and forth technique. And the more of the stone the, that you use, the better. Just more surface area, more to work with. I'm just going back and forth. Back and forth. And um, I don't know how well you can see here, but this water really quickly is getting little gray bits in it. And those are parts of the metal grinding off. You know, and then to go the other direction, on the other side of the blade, same thing. And remember, I'm using 
when I'm going this way, I'm using my pointer finger as a guide to keep the angle steady. And when I was going this way, I'm using my thumb as a guide to keep the angle steady. But back and forth, back and forth. And that's how to sharpen a knife. There really isn't too much more to it than that. Like I said, the more you do this, the better at it you'll get. Um, if you have a really expensive knife that you're kind of afraid to sharpen yourself, sure, go ahead, take it to a hardware store, or take it to you know a knife specialty shop if you have near one near you, um, and ask them to sharpen it if they do it, and you know totally do it. Uh, you can also look up. Uh, in most cities, there's uh, companies or individuals that go around and sharpen blades, and they do this for restaurants and um, markets that serve fresh food and whatnot. A lot of them, too, will pay you a home visit if you're somewhere on their route. And, you know, they may charge you like 20 bucks, but they'll probably do all your knives in your house for 20 bucks. So, um, And if your knives are so dull that they really need a heavy reworking, you, you're going to have to take it somewhere. I mean, even from time to time, I have a knife that I neglect that I really just need to reinvent the edge. Um, so I take it to someone that has, like, heavier grinding equipment, like a grinding stone or a belt grinder. These are industrial types of grinders used for knives. Um, and they can really uh, work in high noodles. And they can, they can put a new edge on the blade, completely new edge. Um, I actually have a chef knife right now that uh, on it, the tip literally broke off about right here. So I want to redesign the tip on it, and I'm going to have to take it to, to a metalsmith um, and have him grind it down in the dimensions that I want uh, and, and reinvent the knife. So... Uh, but yeah, once you get your knives reworked by a professional, you know it's up to you. Keep them sharp, keep them, keep them fresh, keep them slicing. So uh, that's about it. I do want to, for those of you watching, there uh, was a bit of an error that I made when we posted the mac and cheese recipe, and I've been following the threads, and I'm like, why is everybody having so much problem with their roux? So I, just a little bit ago this evening, I went to... Um, the class page and I looked and we have, like I said, totally my fault, um, the ratio for the butter and the flour is backwards um, in terms of the amounts being used. It's a three to two ratio um, and that is um, flour to fat and we did it three to two fat to flour uh, in the class. So I will be putting up a post in the Facebook group. Uh, for you guys, just to correct that for anybody that hasn't cooked yet. And for people that have cooked yet, uh, sorry about that. But uh, on the plus side, you guys are culinary champions. You figured out something was wrong and you corrected it. You added more flour. You worked with it. You added more milk to thin out your, your sauces. That's the work of a professional. Being able to fix the problem is what makes a really good chef. Um, I'm not joking. You know, my work as a professional chef and other chefs will tell you the same thing. We burn things all the time. We put the wrong cut on food. Um, we overcook things. We undercook things. But we're able to correct it before it goes out to a restaurant's table, uh, to a patron's table. And it looks, tastes, smells exactly as it should have been, as if there wasn't a mistake. So that's the key to being a good cook, is being able to send that final product out whether it's you just serving yourself or a group of friends at home or you are working professionally, serving that as it was intended to be served. So, um, I mean, there are some mistakes that just you can't fix, but, and then you just got to recook the food. But you guys have done an excellent job in adapting, and I'm really, really proud of you. So, uh, just bear with me for one more minute. I'm going to just see if there's any questions that have popped up. And... Oh. 
Let's see here. All right, no questions. So I'm going to call it a wrap. Um, thanks for everybody that did join, if you did. Uh, like I said, everybody's product is looking awesome. And look for my post about correcting the info about the Rue ratio. Rue ratio. Say that a bunch of times really fast. Rue ratio, Rue ratio, Rue ratio. Feast. All right, thanks for tuning in. And uh, yeah. Any questions you have about sharpening your knives, share them in the community, post them, we'll go over them, and I hope you enjoyed it. Take care.